This is a fish trap off the coast of Maine. It is called a weir, and it was built in 1940 to catch the small Atlantic heron that are canned as Maine sardines. It works like this. When there are schools of fish in the area, they move into the harbor at dusk, feeding on drifting plankton or pursued by bigger fish. The fish follow along the arms of the weir called leads that stretch out on either side of the oval pocket. Usually when fish come to a lead like that, they chase that lead in and go up into the cove. We're through yeah. talking on the road and say, well, look at that big high fence. I can't get over it and I can't get under it, so you chase it right along until you come to a hole in it. <laughs> so you say, well, there's a hole where it's there, like a door, and you go through it. <laughs> Same idea. <laughs> when the herring have gone by the leads, the fishermen run nets from the leads to shore. In the morning, the fish head out toward the open sea and encounter the netting. They follow it along and go through the opening into the pocket. The fish are trapped. The men pull a net gate across the mouth. There is evidence of ancient wares. Workers digging in Boston found the remains of pylons arranged in a pattern suggesting a ware. Archaeologists say these pointed stakes are about 4,500 years old. In 1585, 400 years ago, John White painted Indians and their ware in Virginia. The Maine sardine industry started in 1875 when Maine canneries began packing the small juvenile heron that come inshore to shoal water between May and November, and in the late 1800s, there were over a thousand wares in the coastal waters of Maine. In the 1970s, a hundred years later, the average number of wares fished was only 30. Fishermen Phil Alley and Gordon Chapin own this weir. Before the heron arrive on the main coast in the spring, in their yearly northward movement, Phil and Gordon have to get their weir ready to fish. On the coast of Maine, a weir is called a weir. I'd say you can take them generally. You start grading <clears> and <throat> cut what few stakes you've got to have about every year, and few binders and brush. I'd dare say hey, if you edit it all right together and done it all right in one row, it'll take you a month. Well, about a month. Take a month of April to do everything. They inspect for winter damage to the pylons, stakes they usually call them. They need straight trees as near to the shore as possible. Spruce is what is available. You got to, cause cut your stage according to the depth of water, and as you know, the depth that you can drive them. And we have to have stakes on the pound about 37, 38, 40 feet.
One year we drove, just about the whole of it, we drove 90 states, was yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, two, three years we drove, 17 or 90. We drove, I think 90 states we drove one year. We drove on the pound, on the bus leaves, yeah. so far apart. But we keep filling in, and we don't have so much to do every year. So if we let it go and neglect it, there'd be so much to do one year. That oh, we'd have to have the whole works. You've got to have a, well, we always call them a seam saw, the rye, really what it is, that uh, we work off from on the way on the spring. Oh, I guess that one is about 12 feet wide and probably 22, 23 feet long. Something's low on the water, it's only on the water about, well, eight inches, eight, nine inches. Just so you can walk around, so it'll be dry, you know. At high tide in the morning, they use Gordon's lobster boat to tow the pile driver to the mooring, where it will be accessible at low tide. You get ready on the high water to do your driving on the low water, get your stakes and your binders and your brush. If there's two high tides a day, you'd work two high tides. If there's two low tides a day, you'd work two low tides. But that's when you can do the best work, oh, yeah. two tides a day, so, and then you can make quite a show. That's, that's almost like two days long, so. On this part of the coast, the average difference in water level between high tide and low tide is nine feet. Extreme tides occur for several days after the full moon and after the new moon. Then the tide will come up one to two feet higher on the shore and go out that much further. Full run tides, they're called. People living here have to plan on that much change in the water level about every six hours, with the high and low water coming about 50 minutes later each day. Watch out. I'm always glad when it's done. Driving's the most dangerous work. Heft, you know. Snake trap me all up at the top. Heavy. That weighs about 200 pounds hanging there. You push it up and let it, and let it hang and get your stake under it and then, then come down on us. Eh? We kind of take our time and don't try to hurry too much, you know. The sun is setting as they drive the last stake the next evening, but before they quit, they check the weir to see where it needs to be braced with cross pieces. The fishermen will start that phase of the job tomorrow. It has been a long day working two tides. Now, if you get your stakes driven, you have to bind them off with binders, which uh, are the smaller stakes, about three to four inches at the bottom, as long as you can find them. And you just nail them on from one stake to another, and you butt on about every other stake, and just lap them. You usually have to have about two to three rolls of, of these stakes to make a good, solid job.
putting in brush comes next. Brush makes a semi-solid fence that will keep fish in the weir for a while unless they are upset by something such as a seal. Using brush cuts down on the amount of expensive netting needed. Phil and Gordon cut this brush last December. Fishermen often call the netting twine. Most pounds nowadays got uh, twine on them. Years ago, they always used to use brush when there was plenty of brush, so you, so you could make them tight. But uh, about all wares nowadays are, are twine wares. Even a lot of places uh, lead to twine. Brush has got such a scarcity that it's almost impossible to get it. Years ago, there was a lot of wares up the bay, up around Eagle Island and uh, North Haven and all up through there. And the fish didn't seem to go in the bays there for a few years, and it was a lot of hard work. And of course, them wares up in them bays that go down every winter. Ice, you get a lot of ice come off them bays because they flatten them wires. Well, there just isn't that much brush. Each year it takes us about three, four hundred spears of brush. To just brush them leads. Well, if you had to build a new wire every year, it'd probably take a couple thousand spears of brush. In addition to the spruce brush, Phil and Gordon use alder brush. The alders are placed in the ware, top up, and sometimes leaf out right on the ware. The placement of a fish ware is important. The main thing is when you build a wire in a cove to start in with, you don't want to build a wire where your fish come in. Because if you build a wire where your fish come in, they won't come in. They're going <laughs> to block them off. If you build a wire in a cove, you more or less got to watch the cove for a year or two and see how the fish come in. Our wire is 65 fathom around it. Down east, down Canada, they have them about three times as big. They have enormous wires. It's about the size that would fit the coal without shutting off too much of fish away. Fishermen have bought a new dory to replace the old one that broke up. They are using Phil's lobster boat this morning to bring it in from the mainland. This is the first fiberglass boat Phil and Gordon have bought and they check to be sure there are no rough places to catch and rip the twine. They also this morning took delivery on a new piece of top twine made up for them by Phil's nephew who was in the twine business. The Indians made nets of vines and strips of bark. When Phil started seining, twine was made of cotton. Now it is nylon. Top twine is tied to the top stakes at high water. Top punch 
go from your top binder up to about three, four feet above high water mark when the tide's up. You have to have these top stakes. And the piece of top twine is about nine or ten feet deep. I think we've had three pieces of top twine to that one bottom piece of twine. And we lay it to the fact that the sun shines on that nylon is what takes the life out of it. You go about three years. Phil and Gordon now have to wait until the tide has ebbed enough to expose the top binders so they can tie down the bottom of the top twine. We used to try to have the whale fishing by the 1st of May. And then that twine stays on there until we get through fishing in November. Then we take the twine off. Repairing the wear nets, Minden twine, is another of the spring chores. And that's something that we're not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> More or less an art all of itself, but, well, we managed to pucker up the hole. We leave a small hole in for a stick or something that come and catching it, you know, and just tear a bigger one. So even if you just pucker the hole up, even if it's mended right, why, well, it's uh, a lot better than a hole. Oh, well, you're bound to get a uh, few holes in it. Barnacles, you know, grow on them binders, and uh, round from that bottom binder to the top binder, where well, them barnacles are when there's any, you know, a gale of wind or a big breeze, and that's all the time working, because them barnacles all the time chewing and cutting on it, and it will chase them holes in it. Every spring, you have to mend them out. Lord, it takes us two, three days, some years, to mend up them, you know, pick holes, we call them. Beneath the top twine on the ware, the bottom twine is attached. To hold the bottom of the nets down on the bottom of the sea, the Indians use stones tied to the net bottom. Now lead weights are used. Well, that bottom twine, I think, is 30 feet deep. This has got a rope in on top that you make fast to your top binder, and then, well, you might as well say a continuous lead line right straight around it. I don't know how many pounds of lead there is on that, but it's, uh, it's all lead. <laughs> when you put it on the spring, you just Put it just as near your stakes as you can get, get it, just so it will slide down by them. And God, that will go to the bottom, just like, <laughs> like a rock. <laughs> Some heavy. It is heavy when you take it up in the fall. Some falls, it's almost impossible to get that pine up. It's got so much growth on it. Terrible. Additional netting is tied on the leads, and a small twine gate is tied beside the mouth, ready to pull across. Phil and Gordon sweep off the dried seaweed that came off the bottom twine and pull out the running twine, which they run from the ends of the leads to shore when the fish come into the head of the harbor. The purse seine is a strip of net with floats at the top and along the bottom a series of rings with a piece of rope as a drawstring to pull it together or purse it. It bags the fish before they are removed from the pocket into the sardine carrier. Floats at the top of the nets used to be made of natural cork, but now they're made of synthetic material. Persane and running twine are kept in dories moored near the leads, handy for use when the fish come. Now the ware is ready to fish, and Phil and Gordon start looking for herring every night. For the next seven months, supper time and evening social life for the two families will be determined by the trips out in the harbor to look for fish. We usually get down all oh, about an hour before that. Usually if there's any fish around, they'll show up before that, just after sundown. But sometimes you don't uh, shut off till 
well, just after that. When we start nights, and when we go, it's rain and shine, it don't matter. Because the night you stay home is the night you should be there. So you've got to go every night, and then come over night. That you, you go down there tonight and look around and not see a fish go everywhere. You want to think it's fish in the bag? You go down tomorrow night and there might be fish enough to eat you out. Electronic fish finders fishermen sometimes call them ricardas, locate schools of fish by sound waves bounced back from the fish to the ricarda. Sometimes a ricarda will fool you. Not only, they might be laying right on bottom, so you don't know, so you're awful used to it. It'll blend right in with your bottom. Before electronics, fishermen used other methods to find fish. A good fellow that had any experience can take a stick, what they call a feeling stick, which is shaped just almost like a table knife, only it's uh, probably 12, 15 feet long, and just at that, one fellow will roll a boat in, and the other fellow will feel the stick in the water, pulling it right through the water like you would uh, a knife through a <laughs> piece of hot butter. And you can tell how many fish are in the cove by how many fish have hit that stick. I know very well, years ago, before we ever had a recorder, that was night after night that we went down to fish in the harbor, that we felt right over in, say, 25 feet of water, and you only feel down of 10 or 12 feet with that stick, and you're feeling right over them, and you wouldn't touch a fish. Every night brings different weather, different chores, different problems. This night, the flood tide has carried into shore rockweed torn loose somewhere by a storm. The next night, Phil and Gordon are fishing rockweed out of the weir. The ebb tide has carried it right into the pocket and trapped it there. Another method of catching small herring inshore called stop twining or stop seining requires a boat, a crew, and stop nets. Stop twiners compete with ware fishermen for the inshore herring stocks. Still having a ware and they have twine. So you just shut a cove off with this twine, go right from shore to shore but you have to put this pocket on outside of your running twine. And then you sign that pocket just saying you do a wire. Stop twine, you can go practically anywhere. That's where you build a wire, that's it. That's stationary. Stop twine, then well, you can go the whole length of the coast. They'll start out in the spring, up off Portland, and end up down in East Port somewhere, come fall, chase the fish right around where there's this fish while they chase them. In the 50s, all cod fishing was right in its peak, right in its best. For eight or ten years, every year, there was all the herring the factors wanted and more. Night after night, more half of it fell right full. We wouldn't bother a centipede of corn. Running well. Had all we wanted. If you're catching the fish now the way it's been the last few years, you're just one of the lucky ones. Years and years ago, you'd go in a cove and build a wire, or you'd go in a cove and wait to catch stock twine fish. you wait for the fish to come to you. If they didn't come, you didn't catch them. If they stayed off a mile from here, or half a mile, or even 50 yards from you, they went right by, and you'd have to wait till next year. Well, these pair trawlers and purse seiners chase the fish no matter where they go, they go where they are. They got to catch them, that's all there is to it. And I think that one thing is that has depleted the fish so much is the fact that they've got them year after year after year. Well, two or three years, the fish didn't have to come to the shore and come to feed. Well, them fish got by for maybe a year, maybe two or three years. But now, they got a darn poor chance of getting by. It's just the case of the, well, is it technology of the world is? The biggest invention, as far as I'm concerned, for a person in was this power ball. If they had never invented that, they wouldn't have these big sayings. 
They would never believe that net would ever come back through that little block, but it will. Big boats, big nets, and improved methods increase the percentage of fish caught. Two trawlers traveling at the same speed can tow a net between them in midwater to catch a very large school of fish. Methods of locating the schools of fish are also improved. Stop twiner Andy Gove has learned to fly so that he may look for fish moving inshore at the edge of dark. God, there isn't a place in the ocean now where a fish can hide. You might have a week uh, of herring, a run, we call it a fish run, say, or a couple of weeks if you're lucky. And then they'll knock off, you won't see another one for a week. Like they might, you might not see any more. And they may be off and on all summer, a month or so, so little small lots, you know. You never know what they're going to be. That's fishing. Scraping barnacles, watching for herring that don't come. They talk about the fish they caught last summer. When the fish come in for that, you can usually see them. They either be flipping or jumping, or you can see the color of them coming along, flashing in the water. And I think that particular night, we see them coming, see them breaking, and we see them when they went by us. And of course, after they all went by, well, we just took a lure and made it fast on the end of the lead and took it right ashore. We get up three o'clock, I remember the next morning, get a breakfast, and, and of course that was in July, it was daylight then, but quarter past four, we went down there. They have to be at the weir at daybreak to scare off the cormorants, fish-eating birds called shags. One thing about shags, if you're not there, them shags will come just at daylight, just before them fish come down, and there's too many shags are lighting them leads right down next to the mouth that they won't let the fish go in the weir. I suppose they experience like we are. They know where the fish are going. If you take a uh, hundred of them shags and them leads and they either drive them through the brush or keep them up in the cold, they won't let them fish come down. As Phil and Gordon watch quietly so as not to spook them, the fish swim through the opening. It was just all so many. If you had 50,000 bushel, there's no more fish would run in that well than what it would take care of. Now, you wouldn't have to worry about fish running in there so that on the low water, they would ever smother. We come home after we got the fish in the well. I just get some of them in the well, what the well would hold. And he come up and call the boat. Seven o'clock, I guess he was here about noontime. He had to a I think it was. She's a nice boat to load. She's just about right. Handy around the way, you know. You take them big boats and any wind, God, they haul some hard. But she's a reasonably small boat compared to what some of them are. But she's a nice little boat. She handles good. The sardine canneries own fleets of boats for collecting the fish and bringing them to the factories. I thought I seen it really nothing but just like a bag with a puckering string in it. You just roll that seine out and work it around the pound until you come to your other end. big square stern pond, you know, wide and rugged and, Lord, you know, you can jump around in them and one fellow can jump on one side and one jump on the other and you'd not know it, you wouldn't upset. You just keep yanking on them lines and just keep pulling them and that'll keep gathering that, puckering that in until them rings come right together and then you just try to pull your rings out and that's sometimes when you can't do it. If you've got a lot of fish in there, there's a big strain. I've seen the time, you'll get more fishing than what you really expected, and then you'll have to let two fish out so you can handle them. Yeah, 
tissue purse is clear and when them rings will come up, every one of them rings will be right together, just like a puckering string. Because after you get them rings in, you get your leads in, then you've got your fish. The only way they can get ready then is to go over the car. Then you have what they call dry your fish up, take in the slack tine and work the fish out in the middle of your sink until you get them right up in good shape. And then they'll start pumping on them and then you can play back and have a rest. The black tube works like a giant vacuum cleaner. It sucks the herring out of the purse seine and through a long box. Inside the box, the fish and water pass over an inclined screen. The fish come down the chute into the ship's hold. The water and scales pass over the still finer mesh screen beneath. The water goes over the side of the boat. The scales slide down the fine screen into the collector bag. At the scales factory, the iridescence from the scales is dissolved by adding a solvent, and the shine is used for luminescent paint, cosmetics, and jewelry. Of course, years ago, them scales was worth a lot of money. Well, when they first started, they was high as 40 cents a pound, but I think this last summer, there was only a dime. I believe they put a 80 pound sack of salt to a hogshead of herring, approximately. The state of Maine says that a herring must be four and a half inches long to be legally packed as a sardine. That's 11.4 centimeters. This is a fish about two to three years old. There must be at least four sardines to a can. They was, you know, a nice sardine, just about right for sardine, five, six. Well, they don't go by the inches, they go by the number of fish uh, ordinary size sardine can haul after their heads are cut off and the tails. Five and sixes are sixes and eights, uh, fours and fives is the number of fish that it takes to fill a sardine can. Can't beat that for lobster bait either. Perfect lobster bait. Phil's son-in-law is getting fresh lobster bait. Fish in a school are usually all the same size. Most of the small heron are found inshore, where they are caught in wares and by stop seiners. Most of the larger fish are caught by boats offshore. The big fish may be smoked and sold as fillets, or they may be cut into cross sections and sold packed in sardine cans, but labeled fish steaks. I've come right up with it. I started in when they used to scoop them with a scoop net. You have to scull your dories out, say, and onside the big boat, and then scoop them. Two men will scoop them into the big boat. When they're all passed up, you dip into it, and then you roll them in over the gun of the dory in three dips, usually loads of dory. And then we went from scooping them to what they call a bailing net. That was by a little stationary motor on deck and take it and heist it up or take them and had a little trip string when you're swinging in over the hole and trip it. And then someone come up with the idea of pumping them. So that is really the best way out. It's easiest and simplest and much faster. Whatever they take, they'll give us a 
the receipt, so many hogs there, and the date, and the boat, and the captain will sign it. The Edward M has a capacity of 63 hogsheads, which is 35 metric tons of heron. You can go the whole year and not catch fish, and not make a cent. But the way the price of fish is now, that if you happen to be lucky and get well, not too many fish, you can make a good year's work. You can make a lot of money. Because years ago, fish weren't worth anything. Well, we've sold a lot of fish for $12, $15 a hog fish. And this year, they were 60. We finished the whale last year, the 29th day of April. It was the middle of July before we saw yeah, one here. Just kept walking. Now, last year, we got three quarters of our fish at one night, didn't we? We, we fished the wire right up until the middle of November. We never saw another herring. See, uh, now if you fished that wire the whole year, you'd have worked a week and a half. So that's why that they have to fill in with something else. They have to get by. It's James and Steve, they always went stop finding, but they always oh, went love fishing. Go stop finding, go love fishing. Well, I tell you, you've got to. Fish and Game Channel is brought to you by Bill Bowman Fishing. That was last year. Now it is November. Time to put the weir to bed for the winter. And this year, Phil and Gordon have caught no fish at all. When we first built the weir, we got a nice run in May, and then a little slack spell, likely in July and in August, dark, mm -hmm. we'd do good, and then in the fall is the best run, right up to November. We've got caught fish now when you have to wear mittens. Yes, sir. Cold ice. Last 18 years, ain't been a hair in the fall. That's what we don't understand, what has happened, see. They may come back, you don't know, there's no one knows. They may be a nice run of fish, and they may not. But where they happen to strike in, well, they'll do pretty good. Some places they'll miss and they won't get in it. Naturally, a fish will go where the feed is. If the feed's offshore, that's where the fish go. That's right. And something's happened to feed the last right. few years. Yeah. That has a lot to do with it. Well, naturally, the fish get to eat. It's just the change of the current has took the feed off. The fish is where the feed is. If that current changes and the feed comes back to shore, I think the fish will be with it. There's no guarantee goes in the fishing. It's just how you're good to win and how lucky you are, I would say, and uh, how hard you <laughs> You might do all right. You might not make a penny. You wait for fish come to you or you chase the fish. In my idea, that's what it's got to come to. You chase everything, you will clean it up. Sure. Attempts to regulate fishing seem to be as old as the human race. The Hanseatic League in Germany in the 1300s regulated the heron fishery. Luther Maddox, the main entrepreneur fisherman, wrote a hundred years ago, it is not necessary for the state to interfere in commercial fisheries by passing restrictive laws so far as they relate to saltwater fisheries. Not only does Maine have fishery laws, but now the Federal Fishery Conservation and Management Act of 1976, also known as the 200-mile limit legislation, mandates further overseeing of the fisheries by the federal government. Both state and federal planners are trying to juggle, in all fairness, food for people, livelihood for fishermen, and maintenance of sufficient numbers of the fish so that they will continue to renew their populations.
I've been with Phil 18 years. I guess you can wrap the way up. About 30, 8, 39 years. Been through fish every year. Except this year. This year, there just, well, just wasn't any. This is Harry Cash. That's all there was to it. There just wasn't any. I couldn't tell you why. Why the Harry didn't come. It just wasn't on the road there anyway. Now, next year, they can't tell them. It might be a fair year, it might be a best year you ever had, and it might be another year there isn't it. The thing you can do is get ready in the spring and hope there will be something. You say you didn't this year. A year or two of good years, a year or two of bad ones, and they've all no averages out in the end. Well, I tell you, I've enjoyed it, though. I've enjoyed fishing. It's fascinating, you know, you can... I guess it is. You're always looking. <laughs> Oh, you know what I mean? If the fish come good, why, it's kind of nice work to take care of them. His father's gone and his brothers are gone. Still he goes down on the dock of the moon. Rowing the dory and setting the twine. And it won't even pay for his time.